All right, everyone. We've had a great morning, right? <clears throat> yes. Absolutely. Okay. So welcome to our first panel on Lessons Learned, Reimagining the Creative Ecosystem 2.0. So we're going to try our best to cover such an expansive and broad-ranging, hopefully inspiring and maybe at times sobering conversation this morning. Uh, our panel is going to introduce themselves. I'll start with the self-introduction. Um, my name is David Holland. I'm the Deputy Director of the Western States Arts Federation. Yeah. California is one of the 13 states and now three Pacific jurisdictions in our region. Uh, California is a very, very special state and place in the United States, and it's our pleasure to work with and partner with and serve folks in California. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, whatever introduction you think is helpful for people to know. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I'm joining you today from what is now known as Denver, Colorado. Uh, so panelists, introduce yourselves. When you do that, uh, if you could reflect on this opening prompt. So tell us a bit about a lesson that you learned over the last three years that has affected your work as an arts worker, a creative worker, an activist, a policymaker. Tell us a lesson that you've learned from the last three years that's changed the way you do your work. Shall I go first? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Hi, it is a pleasure to be here. My name is Tara Lynn Gray. I am the director of California's Office of the Small Business Advocate which is inside of the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. I am a native to California and proud of it. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and ella. Um, I, as I think about the last few years, uh, the work that I do, I call our um, feet in the street, boots on the ground. Uh, I have been doing technical assistance for small businesses for a little more than 20 years now. Um, I've, had, I've held a lot of positions relative to small business. I've been a small business owner for 20 years. I've worked for a couple of small business development centers. I've run a chamber. I've run a community-based organization and foundation. And I think it is safe to say I've seen small business from just about every angle. Uh, and I think that there are many pathways to small business, and the creative arts is definitely one of them. What have I learned in the last um, couple of years? I've learned that small business and um, creative folks have been undervalued in our communities. And I think that the pandemic taught us that small businesses, small theaters, et cetera, really are community <clears throat> institutions, and they are assets for the communities in which they exist, and they need very much so to be cherished and protected. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen McDonald Sakota. I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold from my daughter, so I'm stuffy. I'm hearing my, the sound of my own voice. But it's great to be with everybody today. Uh, I am a relatively petite African American woman with naturally auburn locks that used to be bright red when she was a child, glasses, uh, and I'm wearing a, a red and multicolored scarf. I am proud to be the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. Um, and we are, like many of you in this room, a local arts agency in that we uh, essentially invest in Los Angeles County's cultural life on behalf of the government of, of LA County. And in this role, it's just uh, really been exciting and a privilege to kind of put, put everything that I've learned to date to use, to say, and to show that it is absolutely the government's role to be right at the table investing in the arts and have the arts sit at the leadership table in the largest county in the United States. Come on. 
and to do it as the first woman of color to lead arts for LA County. Okay. So with all that, I'm sure we'll get into lots of stuff because we do like many local arts agencies. We're a grant maker. We're also arts education initiatives that I'm sure we're going to talk about, Prop 20, um, and, uh, and other work there too. Um, but going to the, the prompt about one thing I learned. I mean, it's really hard. For me, it's really hard to distill. I mean, we're not out of the woods yet, y'all. Like, what, what, what three? Like, those three years are not, like, done. I know we're all in here. And I'm very, very thankful that we are in here and that if we are comfortable, we can be in here without a mask. But we are also not, like, a dividing line, and now that's done, right? But looking back, I would probably say, um, in the pandemic, I feel like the pandemic af actually affirmed a lot of things that I either already knew, um, already believed, or maybe even that my mama told me. What are some of those? So some of those might be things like, I'm from Chicago originally, so never waste a crisis. I remember hearing leaders say, I'm serious, I remember hearing leaders <laughs> say that, you know, and not that, and like this was like one of the moments, and I was in the public sector arts previously in the first recession back then too, and capitalized on it a bit. This, but this was like the moment where it was like, yes, we have to do everything we can to move us forward in a moment of disruption. Um, and so I think we are still in that. We are still in that window, but also we know things like you'll never step in the same river twice. So we're also not in the same moment now that we were in a month ago, that we were in a year ago or three years ago. So that opportunity will change, and it is not a lengthy visitor, <laughs> which is another quote that's been coming up lately. It's actually from Sondheim. Um, and so just that idea of how we can translate as much as possible windows of opportunity, even when they come in the package of something very destructive, is, is a critical lesson for me. Um, and just to, since I did invoke my mama, uh, the last thing I'll just say is, um, she always told me, baby, you can do anything for a year. <laughs> you can. So whenever we're going through something, um, or you're taking a risk, or you're going to go to New York City as an artist, uh, and you don't know what you're doing, you can do anything for a year. You can make it, you can turn this into something that builds your character, builds your future, invests uh, in where you want to go. Beautiful. Hard. Hard line to follow, but before I introduce myself, I, I really want to know who's in the room with me. You. Um, if you are an artist, raise your hand. I want to know who you are. If you're a maker, a creative in any direction, how about arts administrators? Are you in the house? Um, I should raise both hands for that one. <laughs> um, educators? Politicians? <laughs> Couple? <laughs> Representatives? Thank you so much for being here, and thank you uh, to the organizers of this amazing convening. It is about time. Um, my name is Chella Montoya, and I work in the arts. I've been in the arts. I'm from, you saw my, my line, I'm a Californian for the arts. I grew up here in California in a very rural community, and I've chased it up and down to find opportunities that I didn't have, and that's why, why I am where I am. I work at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, overseeing public programs, music, film, and I am proud to serve as your chair of the California Arts Council. I want to give a shout out to our council members, Ellen Gavin and Olivia Rayner, who are in the house, and our amazing staff, who I heart much. Uh, and, and I've been in the arts for a while. I've, I've, I'm really passionate about this work, about um, what we could do to remedy the gaps. And that's where I come from, right? And to answer your question, uh, David, I feel like this, this, this last few years has been a confluence of things. It's not only been a pandemic. There's been a racial reckoning. It's about time for that, too. Um, but we are still here. And I feel like it's the first moment in many of our, um, our generation's lifetime where we have a chance to reimagine and reshape how we move forward. We have a chance to reflect and take a perspective, you know, be it from our homes and our windows of Zoom, but you know, a real game changer to make a change. So I, I really want to converse with all of you and see how we could do that together. We have artists, we have um, creatives, administrators, and, and you know, imagination in all directions. So let's do it. Mictuxus, Miwu Osa, Jennifer Bates. I am from the, I live in Tuolumne County, but my family comes from the Calaveras County, 
in the foothills of California. How many of you here, I'm going to take off of you, are native Californians? Yeah. Native Californians. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know that all of us who are from California, grew up in California, born in California, are native Californians, but I'm asking about the native people, the, you know, me being me, being me walk and others in here. But I do see that we have a lot of artists in here and people that work with the arts and work with teaching culture. And I guess I was asked to be on this panel because I am familiar with culture. I have been doing, I am a traditional Miwok basket weaver for some 50 something years. I have worked with many, thank you. I have worked with many organizations and associations that deal with the culture of California. Today I, I practice by um, produce, not producing, that's more you guys are people. But I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a consultant, but I also work with uh, putting festivals together and markets for the California Native people. My, you know, what I like to do is advocate for the California Native people in our ways. And uh, that's what I do. And I don't belong to any coalition or anything like that. I guess I'm on my own little coalition. I like to work with, with the Native peoples here and the artists in the Native field and help to uh, introduce them to people like you guys, you know, and, and the organizations that you work with, and hopefully have you, you know, come in and, and say, hey, we'd love to have somebody here, you know, talk about this or show us this, and that's what I do here. And uh, I was a founding board member of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, and that's been some 20-something years. And uh, I just do things like that. I'm not scholarly. I didn't go to a college or a university. My college and university is outside, and it's the people that I grew up with, my family, my elders, and uh, people like that, you know. And today, still, and the question that I think was asked um, in the last three years, what have you recognized or what do you, you know, uh, know about? And for me, <laughs> I just turned 72. So I am an elder, and people come to me now asking me all these questions, and I honestly, I don't feel like I'm an elder. If you guys knew me, you'd go, gosh, Jennifer. <laughs> but for me, the importance of the last three years and even beyond that was just going out and being with the elders and talking to the elders and learning from the elders. And unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we've lost a lot of those elders. So it's just important, um, I think, if you guys are out there, you dancers, you theater people and stuff, go out there and talk to your elders or the people that you know once were stars and, and main people in, in your areas and talk to them. Just talk and listen. And I really believe that's how you learn and you carry it forward. Good morning, I'm Mark Slavkin. I'm proud to serve on the board of Create California. Um, spent early part of my career in politics and government, and then the latter part of my career working in arts and culture uh, organizations, particularly around arts education. And I wanna thank Tom DeCaney and our Create California team, and Julie Baker and the California for the Arts team for coming together and collaborating to make this possible. So thank you to uh, to all of them. Um, three quick lessons learned from the pandemic. Um, American elected officials and public agencies value the arts more than we have been willing to admit. Um, we saw the greatest transfer of tax dollars to arts and culture institutions in the last three years, which is sort of ironic, because you don't think of pandemics as like a cause of celebration. Um, and yet the shuttered venues grant PP loan, any number of government initiatives, federal, state, local, have really helped the nonprofit arts and culture institutions survive a pandemic. Um, and that is worth celebrating and acknowledging. And I think we tend to make our advocacy agenda too narrow around the National Endowment for the Arts or the California yeah. Arts Council, both of which are really important, but there are many other funding streams that we need to be engaged with in terms of advocacy. And, and the, the fruits of that, I learned, and it surprised me, frankly, uh, during the pandemic. 
Second thing is California voters value arts education more than we've been willing to accept for a long time. Our field has a self-identity of scarcity and victimhood. And it's really important to keep reminding ourselves that 64% of California voters voted for Prop 28. That's just a total landslide. So we need to let go of the baggage of we're the first to be cut, we don't uh, feel loved and valued, and take with pride the Prop 28 passed, and now take with pride our obligations to <clears throat> implement it. And then the last thing, people value the in-person live arts experiences more than I think we've acknowledged. And having worked in performing arts for a long time, I think we just took for granted that the audience would come and we'd focus on who are the artists on stage, what was the program about, did we get good reviews, did we get good ticket sales, but we never thought the audience would be there. Some audiences mm -hmm. bigger than others. The pandemic showed us that without the live audience, the arts ecosystem suffers. They're part, part of the process as much as artists on stage, but that there's such a hunger to reconnect, I think and value the live arts experience, both for what you might see on stage, but also who you might engage with sitting next to you in the lobby. There's just a hunger for community and connection. Yes. So I come away from the three years more hopeful than I was, certainly in the trauma of the first week of the, the pandemic. The last thing I would say that those benefits haven't yet extended to individual artists. The money has been flowing to organizations, which is really important. But too many artists are really at survival or less than survival level. So that needs to be the advocacy agenda going forward. And I know California Arts Council and Kristen Gustavo at Arts for LA are now amplifying that idea of art workers as part of the ecosystem. And they too need to be supported, not just the large or, or not the large, but the nonprofit agencies or institutions, if that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I hope you all were taking notes because these panelists have offered such insightful lessons. Uh, I think that it'll stick with me. Uh, baby, you can do anything for a year. <laughs> I will definitely keep that top of mind moving forward. I do want to pick up on something that Mark uh, left off his comments with, which is about individual artists, creative workers, culture bearers. There's been a lot of discussion about shifting the field such that we really center artists, culture bearers, and creative workers, um, and not just institutions, knowing that there is a history that has sort of led us to this, some of which is related to the culture wars and the fear of supporting individual artists because of the potential for controversy. Um, and some of it is, you know, bureaucracy and tendencies over time and what's easier administratively and all these things that uh, press upon our minds as arts administrators. So I wanna ask the panelists, how can our systems best support and center artists, culture bearers, creative workers, and creative entrepreneurs? And any of you can get started. Just jump in. I was about to jump in. I knew it's a conversation, so I, I did wanna get on the heels of that when, um, and during the pandemic on the Arts Council with my colleagues, I see Lilia Chavez in the house, or Lilia Gonzalez Chavez, our former chair, um, and under Larry Baza, we, um, we brought back the individual artist fellowships. And that was the first time in, I think, maybe 30 years um, that we had funded artists directly, like uh, without strings, fellowships. So that was uh, an amazing, I think, accomplishment right in the middle of the pandemic when artists just didn't even have a way to survive. There were no venues open. Um, the second round is up. So for those of you who are still applying to that, uh, please take a look at that opportunity. Yeah. And if I may, I'd like to follow on to something that Mark said, um, speaking again about the individual. Uh, to me, what I'm seeing in arts uh, really is a social justice movement. And the idea that we place value on the individuals and the individual means of expression, which to me is what art is really all about. You can watch the same play and see different people play the same actor in each 
actor brings something different to that role. That expression is individual. And one of the, again, silver linings of the pandemics of 2020 is that we had a national, a worldwide awakening of the value of individuals. We teach our children to sit in a row, to line up, to act the same. We send this message that we all have to be homogenous. When the reality is, is the best expression of a human life is individuality. And the place where we can express that freely is in the arts. Our keynote speaker earlier, the expression of her art and how she sees and experiences the world. Is there anything better? <laughs> is there? I don't think so. Woo. But I want to just speak to one thing. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to give the actual site. So if anybody knows it, maybe we'll get to it. Or maybe I'll have to look it up for next time. But one thing I was thinking about, Mark, when you were, when you were talking, and I agree with all of your points, um, was that you were saying we were a little bit not, not surprised, but that we have to accept that actually maybe people do support arts education. I have actually found, whether you're looking at like Americans for the Arts or what happened with Prop 28 or even our own, we were doing an LA County, uh, an LA County Cultural Policy Strategic Plan. We did a public comment period where we put up specific strategies that have been culled from our community and we gave like hundreds of people in the community the chance to prioritize them. We saw that arts education or arts for, for young people or for youth was is literally one of the top. And I feel like that is actually consistent if you ask folks, do you think your children should have access to the arts? Should we have the arts you know, in school? Yes. The disconnect, though, is if you ask people, do you think that artists are valued and important part of our society? No. <laughs> they will actually say no. And so we have a values problem in terms of are we really valuing culture, are we valuing arts, are we valuing creativity in our nation? Um, and something that I find myself saying a lot is that I deeply believe that arts and culture and the creative sector is literally one of the most undervalued yeah. activities, sectors, fields that we have in the entire nation. Yeah. In every way you look at it, I don't care if you're talking about economic impact, social impact, educational impact. So I think we are deeply undervalued in terms of the value of it, but then actually what does that look like in funding, in policies, et cetera. But we also have a disconnect where people still have a narrative that arts and artists are either fluff, elite, they don't know what they're doing, the crazy art, you know, all those different narratives that we've had about what artists are and what art is. And so what I want to see is for us to move in a new direction where we are valuing not only the arts, we're valuing every impact of the sector, so economic, social, justice, narrative change, all of that, but we're also valuing artists and creative workers. And we can't be the only ones to say it. I have seen so many panels, and I love my colleagues at, for example, the Otis Report. Who pays attention to the Otis Report? Yes, very important, very important report. Okay, when they have their panels, and it's great, and they've got somebody up there from wherever, who knows, Amazon, and I'm at gaming, and da da da. And every time, or even totally unrelated to that, you watch like, uh, what was that show, The Mandalorian? I watched it, the, and there was this whole like making, this is a pandemic story, there was a whole making of, and we were watching the behind the scenes, they did a round table because they had all these diverse directors direct different episodes, and they were talking to them about their careers. Nobody asked a single question about how did arts come into your life, or what role did arts education play? But it didn't matter, because in that 30 minute special, somehow or other, every single one of them at some point talked about, you know, I really started as an illustrator, and drawing, and then I got into storyboarding, and did every single one of them had a story. But when I see creative economy folks or folks like that up on a stage, I never hear them talk about it as art. Mm -hmm. I never hear them talk about them as artists 
or creative workers. So we're not really using the same language and we're not advancing the same narrative that artists are integral to this work and that the people who did the set design, everything, are central. Um, so I think that's just a big thing for us to gain right now, um, is how do, we, how do we get on the same page? How do we make sure artists are valued that we're telling a narrative that sort of changes and pushes past the narratives of the past that divided us or said arts were elite or artists were crazy or um, you know, right. unstable or whatever the, that thing But how do we value all Seriously. artists? Because I think Taylor Swift feels valued. Oh. And, <laughs> Come on. And I think Beyonce feels valued. Yep. So, that's right. There's a pop culture artist celebrity world that we worship, right? Yep, and right. then the much broader range of yes. people who carry art and tradition in all of its diverse forms that are struggling to make it and may have to leave LA or California because they can't afford to, to, to live here. I just want to throw out the opportunity of Prop 28 is 15,000 new art teacher jobs across the state. Mm -hmm. And I think... <laughs> Believe it or not, we don't have 15,000 credentialed art teachers standing <laughs> in the wings ready to rush in. Damn. So one of the things we need to grapple with is under Prop 28, as it gets implemented, could an artist who has incredible skill and integrity and authenticity in representing a particular art form or culture, is there a space for them to be engaging with kids under Prop 28? Or will it be so narrowly drawn that only people who have gone to college have their bachelor's, have their master, have so many units, have a teaching credential, pass all the exams? Those are like real art teachers. And, and to be clear, those are important and valuable. I don't want to diminish that in any way. But if we shut out all the artists in this room and all across the state and say, you don't qualify, you don't have the credentials, um, be like saying, you know, if Alvin Ailey were here today, sorry, you can't teach dance in our school because you don't have the right credentials. So we need to make space to authorize and, and figure out bureaucratically how to make that happen. Um, and that's where the innovation comes in. I feel like, you know, with, with these resources, we need to stretch the parameters so that we can create the innovation. And, you know, we, we did have a pre-chat, and I, I think you were talking about how you've been practicing all along and, and may not have those credentials, but oh, how, do we, how do we make sure that you're one of those artists and people con teaching our, our communities? You right. know, how do we make sure that we adapt the rules so that the rules fit the realities? We are you know, a holistic artist, a creative community. And we want to make sure that everyone gets that access point to reach our new generation, so. Yeah, I, I do believe that's really important. And I hope that you guys can find some loopholes because <laughs> so many of the native peoples here, you know, they don't have those credentials. I don't have those credentials, but I'm always asked to do things. I'm always asked to teach. I'm always, you know, asked to, you know, uh, be a partner of and, you know, that's important. It's important to me, but it's important to so many other native uh, culture bearers, you know, who don't have the credentials, you know, but they do, well, they still do go out and teach and stuff, and I'm not sure how the funding comes or what it's from, but they do. But if we could get it to where they were part of those 15,000 teachers, that would be so awesome. I mean, to have us out there being able to teach in the schools and the yeah. students. That's carrying on tradition, it's carrying on culture, and, uh, and it's thriving today. And I'm amazed sometimes of the teachers that I do speak to who aren't even aware of what California people do, what, you know, what cultures we have. And, and if you think about it, if you think about fire, you know, the fire, the, the, um, uh, the uh, what do I want to say, forest service and stuff, you know, they're going back to what traditionally the native people did, you know, back in the old days and stuff. And so there's a lot to be learned, but the people who can teach it today aren't, you know, they don't carry a piece of paper. So yeah, I hope you guys find that loophole. And you guys always find loopholes, I know you do. <laughs> I'm gonna create the pathway. We spend five hours almost every month on uh, creating those loopholes through the California <laughs> A policy. <laughs> it moves at a glacial pace, but it is really, really fun. I promise you. Um, join us in person, hopefully. So we're gonna uh, continue along. I think a line that we're we're tracking on, and I'm gonna take us through some of the 
the words that many of us use, hear, uh, talk about, and discuss, and sometimes are perplexed about today. And some of what we're talking about in that uh, past line of conversation was around equity and how to remove barriers to access and opportunities and participation um, and the sharing of our knowledge and culture and heritage. So what do you think is needed to truly build equitable investment, participation, access in the arts? What do we need to do? There's a lot of discussion around this, and a lot of us are working in very concerted ways within our institutions and organizations, in our communities, within ourselves, but what's needed to change the structures of our sector to truly move toward a more equitable approach and having greater access and opportunity for more people? That's a big question, I know, I know but it's sort of the question of the day. It's the question that all of us are gonna to continue to be asked for many, many more years to come. I always like to ask everyone else for the answers, but I just will say uh, on the on the Arts Council, I do. I've served on the Equity Committee for several years, and it's uh, it's a practice. You have to practice it. You know, there are several barriers to access. There's systemic inequity that is um, very difficult to counter when we have, um, you know, Prop 209 and equal protections that really make it like legally illegal to to counter directly. So what do we have to do? We have to refine the aperture. We have to really make it a practice of, of prioritizing race equity because that is the most pervasive and then every other inequity um, because they're interlinked. Definitely. Um, defining equity I think is a big task. And I think as an African-American woman, when I think about equity, and I think about <clears throat> my experience, um, my lived experience, uh, I can think of more times when I have been in equitable situations than I can think of times when I've been faced with equity. And unfortunately, that lack of balance, right, brings about a perspective, right, that colors everything that you do, everything that you see, everything that you internalize, everything, frankly, that you meet. And um, some folks are of the thought, well, just get over it, right? Well, it's kind of like hard to get over something that assaults you on a daily basis. It's kind of hard to get over that. When I think about equity in terms of the work that I do, I think about economic equity. And if there were real economic equity, perhaps the other inequities wouldn't sting so hard. So as I do my work, I think about can I create programs can I do work that creates economic equity to remove a little bit of that harshness? And so economic equity to me means that I create opportunities for folks to get value. And that equity is transferable. It's real. It's tangible. It's not just an idea, but it's the outcome of a program that gives me an opportunity to buy some land, to construct my own theater, to have my own workshop, and that when I'm done doing what I'm doing, making my contribution, that I have something to pass on to my children or my children's children. So when I think of equity, it is real, it is tangible, it is transferable, it is multi-generational. It is, was it Smith who said, land is the essence of all wealth? And back in 1776, um, that still holds true today. Get your corner, create your space, 
transfer it to your family. To me, that's equity. David, can I just put Kristen on the spot in a very positive way? Um, which is the work she's doing in LA County. Um, LA County is a small country and has a, <laughs> it really a five is. person. <laughs> Five-person board of supervisors, and the board of supervisors in recent years have recognized they value the arts to an enormous degree, which has been fantastic. But they looked around at the arts ecosystem in the nonprofit sector in LA, like who serves on the board of these organizations? They're overwhelmingly white. Who's the staff of the organizations? They're overwhelmingly white. Who's the audience of a lot of these organizations? They're overwhelmingly white. How do we change that? And that's where I'd love, Kristen, just to share a little bit, but it's, it's lots of levers. It's not just arts education. It's not just career pathways. It's not just DEI training for nonprofit boards. It's not just engaging with kids in the juvenile justice system. It's, it's sort of comprehensive if you're going to move the, the needle, but you know much more than... <laughs> That's well, about all I know. <laughs> thank you so much for, for lifting some of this up. I mean, I think, you know, uh, in LA County, um, we're fortunate that we did have uh, one thing, for example, to point to is we did have uh, an elected leaders. Uh, there was a motion um, several years back by Supervisor Solis that asked us to have a constructive conversation about diversity in the arts. Well, that actually ended up being a full, a real cultural planning process that centered equity that um, delivered something called the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Initiative. Uh, and so this became ultimately catalytic all throughout Los Angeles County and throughout our work. And uh, when they did the search and, and when I stepped into to my role, I really was excited because I kind of came on the heels of that planning process to step into implementation, right? Bringing this to life. And at that point, it was very clear to me that that needed to be the defining ethos for everything we do. Not an initiative that we could ever point to was on the side, was over there, was going to end when the grant money ended or anything like that, but that actually that would be our defining ethos across all of our work, right? And so in that, we have now had multiple different programs, expansions, initiatives across a body of work, from everything from like, you know, doubling down on our arts internship program, where we are actually investing in paid internships, did a community college expansion, so we're investing over a million dollars every year in people, in 228 paid interns, who then get to be hosted at over 150 arts organizations, um, and also taking the reins of that and saying, we got to have conversations about mentorship, diversity, like what is care? look like in this situation for these organizations, whether they've really had a diverse person there or not. Um, so we've done things like that. And yes, we also did have um, uh, you know, part of our grant making program actually had workshops for arts organizations on do they have a statement policy or plan on cultural equity. So it's been really catalytic. And now we've pulled that forward even more into its next generation. And I think the thing that when I think about it in, in, in terms of our work that I find myself saying is that we really are, are aiming to advance cultural and racial equity. Those two things must go hand in hand. You can't have cultural equity without addressing racial equity, um, as we know. And so we're moving that, though, at the levels of policy, so actual Everything, you'll ask someone if you want to define, what is, what is policy, actually? Policy making is anything the government does, anything the government invests in, and even technically kind of in the reverse, things that it chooses not to partake in. All of those are ultimately policy, this amorphous thing of policy. But then we also have things that are more formalized, like written policies that then get voted on by the Board of Supervisors, like the Arts Ed Regional Blueprint um, you know, in LA County and things like that. So we're moving at policy. like a suite of policies that have been adopted at the board level, arts and justice, linking arts with justice reform, and all these issues, but we're also investing in our programs. So we have the opportunity as funders, local arts agencies, business services to invest. What are we investing in? I think that's actually at the heart of everything. Are we investing in it through a people frame? Is it a place-based frame? Is it culture? Is it creativity? Is it individuals? Is it at the organization? Um, and so that's, that's really important, and then practice. We never let go of the practice because it's always about not just the, the program, but how you had to change the guidelines to allow 
um, folks to participate. We're thinking right now about native and tribal organizations because um, many of the ones that we engage with through the LA City County Native American Indian Commission, they're not a 501c3. So we're like, oh, so that means our structure is making sure that they're not going to. So how are we going to kind of continue to undo and do the work that we need to do internally as well as with our own guidance? So that's how I'm thinking about it, policy, program, and practice. Nice. Nice. And I'm just going to jump. I was just admiring your your pro, the initiative and and really thinking about the channel of um, that you took stock of all the all the boards and the diversity on the boards of these organizations. One thing that's really important is the follow up because that's where you know what what that practice is looking like. How how progress is made? Is it really happening? Because you know, if you if you don't do the assessment, I learned from Assemblywoman Wendy Carrillo. Where's the data? Show me the data yeah. that you are reaching the, reaching those communities. So I hope I hope you take stock soon, and I'd love to see that grow in the right direction. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to? No hear? comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I enjoy listening to what all of you have to say. I'm not sure what I can really say other than, for me, I've always been a person, I've always been a being, and I always see other people as beings, and so all these new words, equity, and all these other things mm. that have come up in the last few years, it's like, it, it boggles my head. I'm going, wait a minute, you know, we're just all people, you guys, we all have our culture, you know, and, you know, I just want to share, the people that I know just want to share, so just, you know, opening the doors to helping us share. And, and a lot of the people that I speak of aren't people that are you know, well off and, and you know, they have to make money on the side and making money on the side for them is doing you know, um, uh, demonstrations and talks and things like that for their culture, for you know, the tribe that they belong to, the people up north, the people down south. And um, I don't know, you guys, I, I really can't answer that because it's not it's not really in my head that we're all so separate that we have to come together. For me, I've always been together, even through the things that I've been through in my life. I'm still seeing everybody as one being. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't even, I can't even identify with when you guys say, you know, what's the pronoun that you want to go by? It's like, Jennifer, you know? <laughs> I'm just Jennifer, you know? I'm not he, she, they, uh, you know, none of that. I'm just Jennifer. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to those of you that do that, you know, because that's what you choose to do and that's fine because life is choice. So for me, and this equity stuff and everything, I just want everybody to be equal. Is that ever gonna happen? I doubt it, I really doubt it. Honestly, I'm too old now to not say what I mean or what I want to say. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's going to yeah. take a lot. It's going to take a lot. Jennifer, you're the embodiment of practice. <laughs> you are practice. That's it. But I mean, you know, what you all have to say is all really, it's good. It's good. You guys are going in that direction. You're trying to make things happen. And, and I respect that. But do I understand it all? Not really, you guys, because we're all one. We really are. And that's all I really can say on this equity stuff. It's like, I really believe we're all one, and we, if we all come together and be that one and work together and, and not be, you know, um, have a title of a different uh, gender or whatever, and if we just be that one and just come together and choose to help each other, I think, you know, life, uh, Culture, art, everything is just going to come together and be beautiful. Mm. Can I pick up on that thread and just say something? I just want to pick up on that thread and just say thank you, um, truly, because I do, I do feel that when you get these are like strategies, and you know, people's tendency to want to codify and create and strategize and name and you know all that kind of stuff. But when you get down to it. I think absolutely what this is about is actually our, our sense of humanity. Yeah. I think, and I want to shout, there are so many incredible friends and colleagues in this room right now, and I just want to also shout out Roberto Bedoya, who's in this room, who I think for many of us really coined the idea of arts and culture as a belonging strategy, um, and Vanessa Wang, who worked with him on that report as well. And so I think at the end of the day, for me, I'm starting to rally around a notion of justice 
is really centered on some, some folks' definition of kind of spatial justice, which is the right to be in space, the right to be embodied and not sort of have harm. And going further, the idea that we could all belong and see the humanity in one another. Um, and so in that, for me, arts and culture is not only all the stuff that we say it is, these amazing benefits, and we need access, and da da da. It is also, as Fabi was talking about, it is this incredible, incredible, uniquely powerful tool for addressing and hopefully unpacking so much that makes us other each other um, and kind of build up. And, and I have to just share, it's actually been really hard for me today because of just even what's going on in the, in the news on my social feeds, and I'm sure y'all are following, but where I'm just looking, it's just like the next story of a young black teenager who was shot just point blank because he just happened to show up at the wrong house and was looking for his siblings. I, it's, it tear, it's tearing us down. But I wholly believe that every story, every song, every film, every book that everybody's relying on, whether they're consciously thinking of this as the arts or not, that all of these are opportunities to build empathy, to build our humanity, so that if it's my child walking the street, the assumption won't be immediately to shoot him down. I believe it is an A to B conversation, that direct that the power of the arts can get us there. So I just really appreciate you bringing us to a level of just like, hold on, can we just talk about humanity? And like just being, because these are really all strategies that we're talking about because we've had to fight and because we have, have felt undervalued. And because to this day, even as much as we're doing, there's still so much more work to do. Yeah. And, and, and to that, I would just add that we have a collective responsibility, mm -hmm. right, for that in order to bring about that end as a collective humanity. And I always have told my children that one of the things that we have to learn to do is to learn tolerance and to teach tolerance, to be curious, to ask questions, not to assume that we know. In situations where young black boys get shot down like that, there is an assumption, not a truth, an assumption. And so if we could all base and center ourselves in tolerance and just respect for that which is different from us, and then see our collective responsibility there, uh, how far could we get, right? Tremendous. Thank you all. Uh, this has been a remarkable and rich conversation on this topic that I know is very much front and center for so many of us and can be totally complex, complex and perplexing. But I think that in this conversation, we've heard so much about our individual experiences, our shared humanity, ways that we can find common ground, ways that arts and culture is relevant, actually essential to this conversation about changing assumptions. So I really appreciate the conversation we've been able to have about this. We are about at time, but I'm going to give each of you one more opportunity to share something with our audience. And my prompt is going to be a simplified version of what I was going to say. Uh, and that is, you know, We've actually talked about a lot of complex things and offered a lot of ideas to this audience. Uh, if we were really to get real about where we are and what it is that we need to do moving on out of the summit and into our work and even later on today, what is one central thing that you want to leave this audience with about how we really can achieve the change and transformation that we seek? one thing that you think should be top of mind for us is going to be top of mind for you. How can we really advance this conversation around transforming our systems, <laughs> social change, justice? What's one thing that we can take into our next moments? 
for, for me, I, I just invite all of you, uh, spring is a time for renewal for Native people, but spring is also the time that we start to open up our dance again all over California. Mm. And if you have the opportunity to go out and uh, be at one of their doings, their big times. I'm not talking to powwows, no offense to anybody who does any of that, but I'm talking going to the big times and the markets and the festivals of the California people and going out there and introducing yourself, letting them know what you do and, and how you just came to see what we do, you know, and just share your knowledge and they'll share theirs. And, you know, I just think that those opportunities are the best. And that's what I, I advocate for, is just having, having people come to learn from us of what we do, our culture, our values, our traditions. And with that, I'm gonna give a little plug. Um, next weekend, I'm going to be at the Exploratorium. They have asked me to come in and consult with them and be a, um, a, a, a leader, or not a leader, I don't like that word, but, um, you know, to come and put together a little market for them. So there's going to be about 10 of us. It's the first time they've done it. And there's going to be ways of the audience to learn. You know, we're gonna do acorn processing. Hopefully George Blake is gonna be there doing his carving. And he's an NEA recipient of the um, Fellowship Award. And Julia Parker will also be there doing basketry and stuff. Another, she's 92 now, but she still goes out and speaks to the public and answers those questions and she does basketry and she just stays she just stays alive she's just a wonderful person <laughs> but there's going to be there's going to be about 10 of us there and we're going to be demonstrating and and talking to the audience about what we're doing and what we do and then the following month in May, I have my, and it's, I'm pretty proud of this, it's my 20th anniversary of putting the market together up where I'm at in Tuolumne. Uh, and I have some uh, cards, if anybody wants any, to come to that. And again, we have people there demonstrating, talking to the public, lots of wonderful, beautiful things for sale, you know, contemporary and traditional. And then the following month, in June, I come to Berkeley and I'm putting together a festival there. It'll be my fourth, fourth one, fifth one, uh, putting a, mark, uh, a festival there. And again, we have all kind, we, I usually get about 10 to 15 uh, Native people who come and demonstrate their, their um, traditional uh, material culture to share with all of you. And so, you know, come be a part of that. Come learn, come listen, come come meet people. And for me, that's what it's all about, you guys. We gotta share our culture. And you guys all have your cultures and I have mine and you know, let's get it together and learn. Yeah. I'm gonna follow that and inspire by, by you, Jennifer. I'm, I'm gonna call myself a weaver of community. I, I really oh. intentionally went up the five and I'm coming down the, uh, the 99 to just be present in California. And I've done that throughout my career, every chapter. I met a, a young, amazing um, young uh, woman that's gonna be on a panel, the youth panel later today. And just, you gotta connect and weave those people through. And even the people who haven't been acknowledged who are already uh, at the top of their life and haven't been recognized for the work that they've been doing as a practice, you gotta weave. So you'll find me in, uh, the April 28 in Stockton with my amazing council. Please join us throughout California and, and be uh, present and engaged in your California Arts Council. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. I would just build on the weaving metaphor. Um, we didn't talk as much as we imagined we would talk when we were planning this, but about um, coalition building what we call collective impact at Create California. And I think the one thing we can all do is be mindful of being at more tables and not so insular as a field. So who else do we need to be inviting who shares our values but is not in the nonprofit arts hat, but an important potential ally? And what are the other tables where key decisions are being made, where the voice of artists and the arts and culture community more generally need to, to be there. In the school world, the example I'll leave you with is dropout in high school is you know, an enduring and important concern, a critical concern. There are lots of initiatives and task forces and committees. It's often not obvious to the people organizing the dropout committee why you would want the arts teachers in a dropout meeting. Like, what does that have to do with it? 
when we all know the arts can be part of the reason why kids come to school in the first place. So we need to be at those tables and inviting colleagues from beyond our circle into our conversations to move the agenda. Mm. And uh, I'll pick up on that one right there because something that, yes, that I thought we would end up getting into and didn't end up getting into is, you know, there's so much of a movement uh, over many years, really, to think about arts in all, or cross-sector arts, or whichever phrase you use, but the idea of the intersection of how does arts show up in economic development, or in justice reform, or in mental health, or working with the Labor Department, whatever those things are. Um, and so I know that for a lot of folks, they're very focused on how do we get these people to believe in the value of the arts? How do we get these folks to want us to be at the table? And the story that I've started finding myself telling everybody is, you need to look farther because that's actually going to be the easy part. I'm telling you the harder part is what are you going to do when they see it and they go, yeah, we want that. And then they all want to try to work, do something. And you actually are not ready. And you actually don't have the infrastructure in your little organization to be partnering with these thousands of employees, big, you know, bohemians. Or they're going to be like, yeah, we're doing the arts. And you're like, well, hold on. I thought we, we, but we have the subject matter expertise. Why are we not at the table? So these are the pieces where I think we actually need to go. So, uh, and we're, yes, we're seeing also lots of solidarity, lots of coalition building, formal and informal, um, with folks really sitting at a lot of tables um, and just really recognizing we're in a like once in a generation moment of investment coming out of the pandemic and also coalitions and movements and sitting at tables and planning. Um, and uh, one example of that very briefly is our organization alone in the last, since tw the end of 2020, by the end of this year, we will have delivered $40 million in government relief money that we transitioned and created and turned it into arts investment. 80 million when I count public-private partnership with the LA Arts Recovery Fund. So it's incredible. The thing is, that's all on top of everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. So for many of us, these coalitions, or I'm in the lava coalition, whatever these things, that's often on top of what we're doing. And we haven't actually yet been built up for collaboration? Are we, are we built for this? Have we invest, do we have the staff? Do we have the time to sit at multiple tables? And so the only thing I can say right now, because it's sort of almost too important to, to, to not do this work and to not build this work, is to try to think wisely about where we want to be. Um, I'll use an acting, I don't know why, I'm, it's just something about being on the stage, like calling back all these things, like a you know, performance thing, they would say, look at, look at, you look at what you want. So if you have a, a scene with someone, this is a romantic interest, you know, you're not gonna be talking over there. You, you look at the thing that you want, okay? But that's about <laughs> energy. So where you're investing your energy, invest in what you wanna build. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. yep. And then the last thing though is take care of yourselves because all of you, all of us, no matter what role we're playing, we are so important to this work this work has to happen even if it's a minute thing of like, I'm changing a grant guideline, that's critical. Or if it's I'm an artist and I'm at home working on my project, that's critical. But we have to take care of ourselves so that we can continue to show up. Yes. 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 A lot, y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's way too much to say on that. But I, I, I thank you so much for going to the dollars because I would be remiss if I did not get a shout out to our governor and legislature for the amount of money that they have invested in relief funds for the arts. We had $165 million in the Venues Grant Program. Happy to report of the 839 grants totaling about $113 million so far. Over 50% of those grants have gone to nonprofit organizations. Then I also want to report that the $49.5 million that went into the Nonprofit Performing Arts Grant Program, we've had 816 grants made out of there, $36.3 million spent to date and those applications are still open, open. So please, if you know anyone who qualifies, go to my website, calosba.ca.gov. Again, calosba.ca.gov, look for funding 
opportunities, and there is the Nonprofit Performing Arts Grant Program. I have forgotten what the final prompt was. So. <laughs> well, that's one, that's one that was thing. It's basically one thing that people can do, an action that people can take in the moments following this that advances what we're talking about, about transformation and change. So one could be applying for that grant program. Go get your money. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's thank our panelists for this wonderful conversation. <laughs> Fabulous. Can we also thank our ASL interpreters? Yes. Yes. and the incredible Julie Baker. <laughs> All right, thank you so much.